Good night, everybody, and welcome to another Tuesday night Bible study. I'm so pleased to be able to share again with the Hillshire United Church community and all those who sometimes tune in to some of the things that we have to say tonight. As you can envision from the opening screen, we're going to be talking about a little bit in terms of hope uh, and, of course, faith. The main scriptures being from Hebrews 11 verse 1 and some other parts of the Bible, such as, uh, let's see what we have coming up here. Psalm, something from Isaiah, something from Genesis, and even something from Luke. Of course, before we get into all of that, we're going to have a little bit of a, a song and then a prayer. And then we get right into Tuesday night Bible study. Hallelujah, Jesus. God's love endures forever. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the great I am. The God who looks down from heaven and comes to us on earth. But you also have been on earth in the form of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So there's nothing that happens here that you have not tasted tested, been tempted by in all manner of things. So you understand the things that we go through. So we ask you, dear God, that as we learn some more about hope, as we learn a little bit more about endurance and faith, that you put in us the same overcoming spirit that allowed you to go through your temptations, 
and allowed you to see some of the things that you did, but in a sinless, sinless, blameless, faultless fashion, even dying on our behalf, so that the very presence of the Holy Spirit could be brought out onto the earth. You are awesome, dear God. Please continue to teach us. Please continue to give us hope. And please continue to allow us to build up our courage and our faith in you. Amen. Good night, everybody. How are we doing? We are the Hillshire United Church. I am as other ever, sorry, the brother Johnny Jermaine Alcock. And we are a church of the United, a congregation, sorry, of the United Church in Jamaica and the Cayman Islands. We have a WhatsApp group. If you are not part of it, please do put some um, comments in the chat or even DM us on one of the platforms that you see screened across the screen. Email us or call us and we can send you messages in relation to things that are happening on the church program. Please do. If it is that uh, you need some assistance, you can even visit our physical location. We stream every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. for Bible study on these pages as well as on my personal pages. And we also um, have um, worship service on Sundays at 9 a.m. That is also streamed on all of the different platforms um, th that it can stream on. So all protocols observed. Tonight, we are delving into a space that many think uh, is a little bit intangible. It's a little bit un you know, impossible to see. Faith, it says in Hebrews, which we'll get to, chapter 11, which is called the, the book of faith or the, the chapter on faith or kind of a hallmark, hallmark as in H-A-L-L-M-A-R-K of some of the heroes of faith tells us that it is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen because it's very difficult to say, you know, I can see hope or I, I, I have touched faith or when I'm moving to the next stage in my life, I know specifically that this must happen this way or else, you know, I know so. And we can't because only God knows the future, one, and two, only he understands the fullness of the paths we take and the different things that may happen over here and over here and over here and over there that will cause everything to lead through to his eternal destiny. It's impossible for man to track all of that. And the truth is that because we have this limited scope in our time space of uh, time matter and, uh, uh, you know, the, the things around us, that we allow that, which is the unfortunate thing, to limit our view of who this limitless, almighty, everlasting God is and what he can do. So obviously, there are limits to the scope of the things that are around us. Jesus himself, when he was brutally tortured on his final days on earth, had to get assistance to lift a cross to go to his own death. And, you know, in this capital punishment, he shows that the human body, even though he is God and can do anything, has its limits, right? But can you imagine their confusion, their hurt, their pain, their fear, their worry and doubts that transformed into glorious exaltation. Of course, it wasn't glorious originally. It was more surprise and still fear on Sunday when he did rise from the dead by the glorious everlasting power of the Holy Spirit, which will also raise us up from the dead in the last day. But this is what hope is. We go through some things and it will brutally beat us up, annoy us, frustrate us, put us down in the dull of things. 
We have to grab a friend over here to help us. And somewhere, I don't know how God does it, somewhere in the pathway, we still cling to God and ask him for some assistance in some things. And even on the cross, when Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is uh, an Aramaic phrase, uh, you know, the dialect in Hebrew that says, my God, my God, why art thou forsaken me? Taken from Psalm 22. We may cry those things, and we may think all is lost. It seems impossible. But what God has taught us is that if you hold on a little longer, it took him three days, right, in the grave to come back up, something will happen. In fact, before he died, he put the entire thing in motion by deliberately waiting four days for one of his friends, Lazarus, whose sisters, Mary and Martha, bawled on the place, saying, Jesus, if you had just come, he would still be alive. He waited until the man passed through his disease and then died. And then four days passed and then he came and showed his resurrective power. So much so that, you know, Martha was saying, but if you open this grave now, is very stench will be coming up. Oh, Jesus, I love that bit of the Bible in John. And what can you do now right here, God? And he proved them all wrong. He's the God of the earth who can make even the impossible possible. And by that very act, he showed that he was in control of our very natures, even in the point when you think all is lost, theologians have theorized that he waited that long because in the Hebrew tradition, it was said that if all those days pass, then more than likely he would not be able to come back up from the dead. You know, sometimes something can happen to somebody. They weren't as scientifically or medically advanced as we are. So by the time that finished, they presume that, well, the person must be dead now. And so he broke off all the theories and thoughts on these things by raising a man who died from an illness. Think about it. So he must have, one, put enough energy back into the man through the power of, you know, the Holy Spirit that his entire body reanimated and the corpuscles and the vessels started to pump back some of the blood through his heart around the system. His brain, which you know should be dead <laughs> after about uh, 5 to 15 minutes, it says in the medical literatures, when there is no oxygen or you're not put onto some supportive care in an ICU with oxygen and having blood pumping around through it, should be dead as knit. And his entire things started to come back and not only that but whatever disease that was in his blood or in his body must have been cleansed and taken out so the man got back up and was himself whole again and jesus then said watch this part now loose him and let him go and I'm doing this as a preamble because I find that sometimes we go through the stages just like Jesus did. And the final part of us moving to the next stage of what we need to does not occur. And this is what happens. We see Jesus in his very form and still doubt and have to say, can I touch the nails in your hands and the nails in your side which which of course i'm referencing mr thomas the apostle thomas or jesus himself he the man walks out of the grave so they probably even thought maybe he's a ghost now or something and he has to say loose him take, take off these bandages and things that you wrapped him up in thinking that he was dead not knowing that i was coming to raise him back from the dead that is what you have to do in your life when you're thinking about hope and faith and going through some things in God. It doesn't happen in the time span that you think it's going to happen in. 
God has a way where he says, in my time, it says in Isaiah somewhere, I, the Lord, will make it happen. Yeah? I am the Lord God of all flesh. It says somewhere else in the Old Testament. Is anything too hard for me? We doubt him because we have our limited scope of the things in front of us. And then when we push through and we get a little beatings in life and we cry out and a few things look like it start happening. But we don't hold on to the last, last part because we tire and we get frustrated and we fear until the vet. Do you know that is at that point when we start to fear the most? It said somewhere that it is at the point when outside looks the darkest, that it is closest to the dawn. And so I'm imploring everybody who is tuned into this thing here tonight. I don't know what season you're going through, what issues you may be having in your life, what may be happening in your finances. What may be happening for you relationally? What may be happening to you at your school, at your job? Maybe you have some, you know, court case up against you. Maybe you have some issues with your children who have gone astray somewhere. Maybe it is that, you know, you, you have some illness that you're battling. Or you have some big medical bill. Or you have some family member who is struggling in some way, emotionally or mentally. I'm telling you, oh God, hold on to this Jesus still. Just like that woman who was had an issue of blood for years, 12 years. And, you know, it was like worthless going around to all these physicians because nothing could stop the flow of the blood. But then she saw Jesus and in a crowd, somehow she crawled her way through and said, but if I just touch the hem of his garment and somehow that blood just stopped immediately and it is in your mind that sometimes these things have to change. Because if your mind doesn't start changing, if you do not start repeating some good things to yourself, if you do not realize the fullness of who you are, if you do not start to touch and see there is grace still, there is forgiveness still, there is mercy still, there is power still in God, then you will not get to the point properly. It happens in your mind. Your mind has to change. And you have to know that there's still some things possible with God. So watch this. What it says in Psalm 33. That his great strength is what it is. His great strength. So we always think that when we're going through the things, we're going to just do it our way. Wrong. If you try doing it your way, you will fall into the strange sins and the traps and the evils of the world. God said do it his way because when you do it his way, it may take longer, but you will go through the disciplines of the tenets of the faith, reach to where you're going, and you learn some things and you build your character. I'll read a bit of chapter in relation to that. But if you do it the world's way, you may go a little quicker because you might cut a little compromise here or there. But then in the end, you will have to battle back some of the wrong things that you did before you reach to where you went to. And then you fall into more sin. And then you fall into more problems. And then you have an issue. Because you stray from God thinking that you would reach to God by doing some of the things quicker. And then have to reassemble and come back to God anyways. So just do it God's way the first time, please. And you will reach to where you need to go, please. This is very simple logic from the God of the earth himself. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholded all the sons of men. I'm reading from Psalm 33, 12 to 22. Good night, everybody who's streaming on. Put in some chats and... Uh, Things in the comment if you have any questions we will do 
answer them there in the comments. The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh up on all the inhabitants of the earth, he fashioneth their hearts alike, he considereth all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. None. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waited for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, according as we hope in thee. So this is a psalm, right? That is uh, talking about how we sometimes rely on the things of the earth, thinking that will give us strength when it won't. It's using analogies of the things in that time. Kings with their armies and men who may use the you know, horses for travel or in war and so forth. But of course, we fashion these things that we think will help us. There's another Psalm, Psalm 20, verse 7, that says, Some trust in horse chariots and some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We trust in these things, but they're not going to really save us. The one who is the creator and the author and the finisher of all things is the one who will allow those things which we thought the worldly stuff that would save us to save us it is through him it is through working through him that we get to the fullness of the things that we need jesus never traveled around on mules and camels and horses in fact in his triumphant entrance on Palm Sunday into Jerusalem, the man had to borrow a mule. He borrowed the upper house or the upper room so that he could go in there to have a last meal with his disciples. He had no room or place to stay or put down his head, he said. Everywhere he went, he relied on the friendliness or neighborliness of those who he was coming to speak to or the community he was coming to speak to, and he just stayed at their residence at one point he asked um peter to just go into a river somewhere or, or near the sea and take out a fish with a coin in there so they could pay something for something at points when there was nothing or seemed to be nothing he would pray and multiply some things right in front of their eyes. He is your strength. He is the one who is going to give you some of the things that you think you need. And sometimes, please, we have so much that we think we don't even have much when we do. We have enough many times, even more than we probably need. And we have a wrong way of thinking. Remember, I said your mind has to change when I was talking about hope and faith. And see things in the wrong or the opposite direction. I will get to it when Jesus gives a very um, weird talking in Luke chapter 12. I'll get to it. And I'm sure it's going to shock many people. But listen to me very, very closely. First, you have to start off with that gratefulness to God. You have to see him as the one who is up there. And he's considering all the works that you do. And then you rely on him to do the things that you can do, but for him to do the other things that you cannot do. 
his great strength. When the Apostle Paul had his weakness, wherever it was, on his body, the, in his infirmities, and he said, take it away from me, God. The Lord said, no, I'm not going to take it away from you. Three times he implored him. And then the Apostle Paul came to the conclusion that in his weakness, he would see God's strength. His great strength. So if we want to get to this hope and this faith that will be enduring, we have to see this God as the one who is the provision, the one who is the the person who is going to get us to the place that we need to go to. The one who is above all things and before all things. And the one who is steadfast and with us at all times. I'm projecting something that I said earlier. Psalm 20 verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen. But we are risen and stand upright where is your hope and in your faith in the things around you and what they can do for you i hope not because they will all falter and fail you at some point the only thing that will stand sure and will not fail is jesus christ of nazareth is that sure anchor is that sure place is that bulwark that shield and strength. We're about to read that soon from Genesis. But before I get there, I want to read this thing that Isaiah spoke of in chapter 1 of his book. And it's, it's a very hard saying, but let me read it anyways. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotan, Ahaz, and Ezekiah, king of Judah. Skipping down to verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? saith the Lord. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When he come to appear before me, who had required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. Is iniquity even the solemn meeting? Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hated. There are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. This is the God of the earth speaking through Isaiah, you know. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. Now, by this time, of course, the prophet Isaiah wanted to get into the minds of the people of Israel. How their offerings to him, which was their way to try to atone for their sins, they went up regularly to the temple of God, was becoming to God very vain. And, you know, kind of unnecessary. What is the point of coming up to me to offer all these things and nothing has changed in your heart? And then he looks, Isaiah, let me project it back. 
and says, but you're not doing these things. What's the point of coming for repentance? And you have not repented. What is the point of offering me things? And you're still doing evil. And he says in verse 17, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve your oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And it is this kind of weird, sinful pattern that we have always taken. This is way back, uh, probably 4,000, almost quite a while now since Isaiah. And he's crying out to the people of the time to know the God of the earth enough so that when it is that we want to know how to be faithful in life and to hope on something that doesn't die, that we do it to the God of the earth. You know what they were hoping in? That they would come up to the temple, they would offer some worship, and they would, you know, kill the fatted lambs and the goats and all the things that Isaiah named. Oh my God. And the goats and the bullocks and the bees, I try to read back everything that he said, and the rams, and then all of a sudden everything would be good. It's not going to work like that. He himself said, Jesus said, no, come let us reason. It is what is going on inside here though your sins are scarlet they will be turned white as snow if you are obedient to god but if you refuse and do some things that you rebel in then you you will be devoured by the things around you of the earth you understand if it is that you want to get to hope and endure in some things for god don't watch the world and what they are doing. Do what God has commanded to you to do. Live obediently. Follow him. Cease to do evil. Be just to those who are around you. And plead the cause of those who, who need to get this justice and mercy as well. And then all of a sudden, you have impacted yourself enough inside and changed and been renewed so that hope starts to radiate from you and go out into the atmosphere that is around you but if you just go and you kind of in a nonchalant manner you know you you go and you do your things in the environment and you you know kind of an, a religious thing isaiah says and there is no real heart behind the thing then problems because you won't see the hope that you were looking for. How can you? How can you see Jesus when there is injustice? How can you see Jesus if those who are around you who should be pleading their cause for you are not? How can you? How can you see Jesus if you yourself are doing evil things and hoping to get good things out of it through God? Not going to happen. And so the pleading of Isaiah is the same pleading that many of the uh, Old Testament prophets pleaded, especially during this period, right before they went into Babylonian uh, captivity. But it's the same pleading that we have to be doing over and over, generation after generation, because of the way we are, our sinful natures. And so even before this time, Jesus had a way to talk to the forefather of the Hebrew nation to remind him who his strength was. Remember, we spoke about great strength, who you should put your hope and faith in, which is God. And he said that his shield and great reward was in God. Now, Abraham had a problem. He was given the very task to birth a nation but he was an old man and his wife was old but also it was said that through him and that nation would be the blessing of the entire earth but he couldn't see it it just looked impossible it, I, it was 
not visibly, you know, there, tangible to touch. But watch what God does with him. And if you read through Genesis, the first section, before it gets to the stories of Isaac and Jacob, you will see this happen about two or three more times where Abraham has a vision and God starts to show him some things to build up back his faith to remind him that there is possibilities in me. Stay hopeful. You may think that nothing is happening based off the first promise that I gave you, but I am still here and I am leading you to where you need to go. Verse 1 of Genesis 15 says this. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine ear. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine ear. But he that shall come forth of thine hope, thou shall be thine ear. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So, you see the difference between what Isaiah was trying to shout and plead out to the people in the times of his time. And how Abraham's faith was built up simply by believing and understanding in this simple promise and, and hope in God. He couldn't see anything in his old age here. He couldn't understand how it is that something would be happening for him still. And God said, look up into the sky. You're going to see a one bag of stars. Your people, the things that will come out of your loin as offspring, and nation shall be birthed. And when you look up in the sky and you're counting, there's no way that you will be able to count the amount of people that shall come out of you. And he was right. Very right. Because obviously it's God says so right. But to Abraham, because he started to believe in God and understand some things you know, otherworldly. He had stepped into a zone through this vision that was not even here on this plane. How could he even understand what God was talking about? And he looked and he saw something before him that he said, all right, let me stick with this. Because by this time, his wife had gotten frustrated and said, well, go and sleep with um, Hagar, one of their servants. And they had a child called Ishmael, who, of course, would birth the Arab nations. And the unfortunate thing is that when strife started and Agar was thrown out and eventually came back, and then eventually when um, Sarah birthed Isaac, strife started again because, of course, he had two women there in the house and two people who could be heirs what he possessed but of course the real heir was his the one of his wife not the the handmaid so we have to be careful that when we see the promise of god or we hear it we're not running trying to do our own things in our own eyes we're not doing it our way we're not making a sacrifice instead of being obedient to god we're not trying to do it in our own strength. But we're hoping for that fourth day, like Lazarus was written for the, from the dead, or that third day where Jesus himself was risen from the dead, or that twelfth year when that lady had touched the hem of Jesus' garment. 
something is happening or that hundred year of Abraham where something had to burst forth eventually in that old age. Oh, I don't know how God does it, but somehow he causes the impossible to become possible in a hope that cannot die. He is the God of the earths. And if we can just trust him a little more, if we can just step into this otherworldly plane and do it his way, then we're going to start to see some things because we believed in the God of the earth. So Hebrews 11, which is this chapter on faith, references this same man, Abraham, at the time when we read it in Genesis 15, it was called Abraham, not Abraham as yet, because his name had not been changed by Jesus as yet. But eventually was called Abraham, the father of many nations, right? And uh, Hebrews 11, let me project it to the screen, gives us something from Apostle, the Apostle Paul where he starts to name some people who did some things unbelievable because they decided to trust in something that seemed ah not even real sometimes not tangible where you would doubt where a man in the new testament even says god i believe what help my unbelief and so hebrews 11 says no, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So if God, this is basically what the Apostle Paul is saying, can through himself, create everything from nothingness. It says it in the first few verses of the Bible. You have to watch me because I'm getting excited. The first few verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And the spirit of the God moved on the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And all of a sudden, so nothingness to something. So the things which are we are seeing right now came out of God's mouth to say, let there be light. Poof, something started to pop up into the atmosphere. And then we saw what we can see now. And Abraham, he goes into his imagination. You have to beat yourself down and submit yourself to God sometimes. And start by faith. You will read this term by faith many times in Hebrews chapter 11. To believe God, even though he couldn't see it, and it was unimaginable, unimaginable, sorry, how it could even be possible. But by faith, I'm reading from verse 8 now. Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith, watch that term. Also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead. So many as the stars. Remember, we read this part where God says, you are my shield and my great reward. Look up in the sky and you will see stars in multitude and your nation that will birth from you will be greater than the amount of stars that you can count in the sky right now. So this is the Apostle Paul just repeated this section. And as the sand, which is by the seashore, innumerable. Those all dead in faith, all died in faith, sorry, not having received the promises, 
So they saw some of the promises that God said to them right there in front of their eyes, right? But having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country and truly if they had been mindful of that country from once they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. So they saw Isaac born. They saw him then take Rachel. And then something started happening in Jacob form. But they didn't understand what was going to happen next. And that millennia later, Christ would be born from that same bloodline. And that that man would be the one who would do some of the things that I mentioned, which seemed impossible. They understood it, you know, an inkling in the mind. But they received that promise, but they didn't see the others which were afar off. So sometimes some of the things which were happening for you, it's not even God telling you to do something for you. It is for things way off. That you cannot even understand that he's positioning you. That if you buy it, stay in it, struggle it through it a little, endure. And then when you persevere, you build a character, you do some of the things that God asks you to do. That by faith, generations following you will be blessed because of the things that you did. Don't lose hope. But now it says in the last part of this section that we are reading. They desire a better country that is an heavenly one. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared them a city. So they came out. This is Abraham and Sarai, who eventually became Abraham and Sarah. From Ur of the Chaldees. They even paused another time in another pagan part of the world, Haran. But they then came into the land of Canaan, not knowing what this was all about. They left all that they knew. Somehow God blessed them because at one point he had so much stuff going on for him that even he and his um, nephew Lot were striving over who should be where and what part of the land they should take. He had so much... Um, servants and men that at one point they took Lot, his nephew and he and all of these men ran down these guys and you know did some warrior thing and got back his nephew and his family so the man had some stuff going on for him the man built it some things right and he passed it down to generations and generations so much so that when jacob came he had 12 sons. And the line of that continued over and over and over and over and over. Until now we actually have a nation that is Israel, that is capital in Jerusalem in the Middle East. All from this man and the faith that he decided to have. And even more importantly, Jesus was born from that family line. And we're all blessed for that. Because this was the God who came on earth so that we ourselves can be saved. Can we? Have enough faith past the things that we can see? This is how the elders obtained their good report. This is the old time religion, as it says in that song. Where you follow God, even if it looks stupid and ridiculous. At one point, God saved eight people because a man decided when there was no rain ever on the earth. And probably he was far away from any, you know body of water to build a boat on a land 
and say to people that God's judgment was coming, prepare, watch out. And he and his family were saved and the entire earth was flooded. Have faith enough. Noah did. To build before the rain even starts. Have faith enough. Did Abraham to ask very gently to save some people in that land of Sodom and Gomorrah. His nephew Lot was saved and his two daughters. So at one point there's a remnant of eight. At another point there's a remnant of three. In the end, because of the fate of these same elders in Hebrews chapter 11 coming down the line and us now starting to understand some of the same, same things of God and being in faith and knowing about endurance, there will be an even greater remnant, it says in Revelation. More than the eye can even see. Thousands upon thousands, it says. And those who will be there will be rejoicing in the very fullness of a God who is unbelievable. How is everybody doing? Understanding everything that we're saying here? If you have any comments, please put it in the chat. And um, please do, please, um, if you have any Bible scriptures, that you see that you want to discuss here as well, that you can uh, just put it there and we can discuss them. This is um, just a back and forth between all of us discussing and fellowshipping together. So I want to read something from Hebrews chapter 5 before I get to the last part of what we want to discuss, which is going to be a killer, I guess I could say, from Jesus himself. So Romans chapter 5 says this. Whoops. Let me take off the thing about Hebrews chapter 11. But I want you also to go into Hebrews chapter 11 and read all the other persons who the Apostle Paul mentioned. Just didn't mention Abraham and Sarai, who we're talking about tonight. He mentioned the other persons. Some of them I mentioned, like Noah. Even mentioned Samson, David, and so forth. And understand why he mentioned that by faith it was imputed upon Abraham for his righteousness. Even before you come to God, you have to have faith and believe that he is the one who died on your behalf and then you move into the fellowship with him. But it is that same faith that will take you through. And you have to kindle it over and over because of the trappings of this world that will frustrate you and lead you into sin and Romans chapter 5 around verse 3 says this and not only so but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope make it not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So the very same thing which was pumping right through Jesus, that Holy Ghost, which caused him to do so much miraculous things, which even rose him from the dead, is pumping through you. And it is kindly asking you that when the tribulations of life comes, and it will work your patience. That you should stay in it. Build up your experience. And then you will get to hope. Patience. You see the pathway. Let me project back the KJV. Romans chapter 5, 3 to 5. Tribulation will come. But stay patient. Patience will build your experience. And experience will give you hope. The NIV um, puts it in these terms. That sufferings will come. And then it will try your endurance. 
after you have persevered a while, and then you will build character, and then you will get hope. But stick with God a little bit. Suppose Abraham had got given up. We would never have seen Jesus. Stick with God a little bit. Suppose Noah had, had given up. He would not have saved anybody at all. Stick with Jesus a little bit. Suppose that woman had seen Jesus pass by and not even decide to even try to come up to him and do anything. She would have died with that issue of blood. Stick with him a little bit. Suppose Mary and Martha had just seen Jesus and gotten bitter and said, Jesus, why did you take so long? Nobody come now, man. Stick with him a little. He's the same resurrection and the life. Stick with him a little. This Jesus is working something that you have to stay patient in and endure it enough that it will build up your goodness and kindness and your patience, your self-control. It will give you character. That is the whole point of the work of the tribulations and the frustrations and the sufferings of this life. That's what people miss. They think it's just the devil come to beat, beat them up. But it is God who is in charge of these things. And you are supposed to maneuver through that environment. Trust in God enough to know that he will see you through. He is your strength. And you stick with him through thick and thin. So that at the end you said, I have run my race. I have kept the faith. And you will see that good report, just like all the elders saw it. And you will reach from that suffering which you thought would kill you to that hope. You will see this God lose some things off of your life. You will see this Jesus say, Peace be unto you. Why were you so afraid? Do not be afraid. Look at my hands and my side. I am the same God of the earth. Did I not tell you that I must go through some tribulations and sufferings before I come to the very glory which I told you about? Believe in him, brothers and sisters. That hope Hope doesn't just pop, come like that. It comes through the very stages of seeing something's bad happening. But sticking with Jesus enough to get to him through your faith. Get to him through your enduring, perseverant hope. You will see it, but you have to stick with God a little bit. Now, Jesus came on earth, as I said, and started to reveal some more things about who we are and what we are capable of through his Holy Spirit. And I believe him because he is God. And anything else that comes up in my way, I don't know where it comes from. And uh, I may suffer a little bit. But I'm going to trust this Jesus because if he is God, he is truth and he must know what he's saying. So look at what he's saying here. So, and it's going to shock you because last week we spoke about the fact that a man came and said, Jesus, tell my brother to share in his, his inheritance with me. And Jesus says, am I a judge and am I a divider amongst you? And then he said something even more amazing that in a parable, he starts to speak of a man who builds some things and started to get bigger and bigger and kept building and building. And then Jesus called him a fool because he wasn't doing anything for the glory of God, just for his own sakes. And now, in the chapter following that parable, look what Jesus says. Oh my God. 
This is going to shock and offend many people. At verse 32, it says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Many people know this verse and they love quote it. But do they even know what follows it? It says, sell that what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that fail it not, where no thief approach it, neither moth corrupt it. You understand where Jesus is going? All the things that you labor and try to get in this life, it will all fade away and decay and probably even failure over time. But if you build up your hope enough in heavenly things, we spoke about seek things above last week, and do your life enough to glorify God, then you're building up treasures in heaven. You're doing things God's way in hope enough that you are getting his kingdom here on earth. And it is not through the possessions. He's saying, sell what you have. Look what Jesus is saying. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. How does he say you get the kingdom? Sell what you have, give alms, provide yourselves, bags which wax not old. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourself like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. So you, show, you see how God takes his time to do some things. And he's taking his time. And he's taking his time in long sufferings and patience to ensure that we build our character. And that those who must be saved and will repent will repent. And he's taking his time. And maybe the first watch comes and we don't see anything. And maybe the second watch comes and we still don't see anything. And the third watch comes and he's looking for those who are going out with their lights burning still. And girded about with their loins Girded with the truth of God. Building their treasures. And then it says this. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. But ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh at an hour when ye think not. So Jesus is lament to the man in his parable from last week, from Luke chapter 11, was you're building, building all these things. Are you trying to do some things to glorify me? Because yet tomorrow I will come for your soul. You fool, he said. God said that, you know. And so this parallel chapter showing more about the kingdom is saying, look, you have got to do things God's way. Because I will come at an hour which you don't know. I want you to keep your lights burning and do some things hopefully through me over and over again in your life. Over and over again even when it seems difficult. Over and over again even when you worry about the finances. Over and over again even when things look dry keep hope in me. Over and over again. Stop trusting in your possessions and the thing that you have because i'm even telling you to sell them and stop giving yourself frustration so please this is a hard scene it is probably some of the hardest things that jesus had because a man came to him once and said yes i follow the law what else should i do Jesus says, sell all that you have and come and follow me. And he left in and, and was heartbroken because it said in the Bible he had many possessions. And then the disciples asked Jesus, so how hard is this? 
who says it is harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Jesus is saying this. But if you look closely, he's not saying that you cannot have wealth or you have some things going on. That's not what he's saying. He's saying make sure it doesn't have you. That you're not lost in for the things of this world and your possession as if they are your Lord and you are idolizing those things. Ensure that you break yourself apart from those things so much. That you're doing your work to glorify God but building his kingdom in hope and endurance. Yes? Because Abraham, who we spoke about, was a rich man. Remember all the things I told you that he had and that he did through faith with God and the possessions that he had. Watch what you're doing in life, please. The kingdom doesn't come through pleasure. The kingdom doesn't come through the very us doing things through our own strength. The kingdom doesn't come through sacrifice and doing all sorts of things all around us that we think will bring God to do some good things. The kingdom doesn't come by trying to do things not God's way that will do what we thought God wanted. Like Abraham and Sarai started to do some things with Agar. The kingdom doesn't come by the very nature of us seeing God say some things or hearing him say something I will get a promise. And then we run into it. And pause at the point when it seems hardest. Hope is the substance of things that we cannot see. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We are never going to see it. How can we? Can we know the future? We are never going to understand it. How can we understand it? The God of the earth is mysterious. And he doesn't faint or grow weary like us. And if we understood God or the things of him, then he wouldn't be God. How can we even see it? When it is hope, hope is not supposed to be seen. But God is saying to you tonight, despite what you can see or hear or even your mind starting to give you some negative thoughts, he is still right there. Trust him enough to know that he can take you to the next stage of whatever it is that you need to go to. God's way is upside down. It says somewhere in Acts chapter 16 and Acts chapter 17 that the apostles went abroad and started to talk about God and bring out his gospel and talk about his kingdom. And the men who were there in some of these places said, look at these men who have turned the world upside down and been in an uproar around here. Now they have come here also. But God's kingdom is bringing the world which is broken and messed up the right side. It's just that the world is the wrong way around and it has to be spun back around. And when it is that we do things God's way which seems weird and it brings us through pain and it is hurtful and it is the opposite way and it is upside down, we will shock those who are around. Because everybody is trying to do things their way, in their own strength, through sinful manners, or by gaining some things in life. That's not what God said. 
and the hope of God, which rests in your heart right here through the Holy Spirit, will cause you very much to see some things that you could never even fathom simply because you trusted in something that can never die and you hoped in something that will surpass the very natures of time and matter of space which is infinite you had faith by faith in an everlasting being that is so powerful that he spoke four words and everything that we can see and that we can't even measure yet with our telescopes to figure out was birthed into existence. That is the God we serve. Do not limit him. Hope. And know that by faith, Jesus will give you a hope that endures. I don't know where you are tonight in your life. Maybe it is that like the lady with the issue of blood, you have some problems with your um, physical health. Maybe it is like Noah or Abraham, you are given some word from God that you can't understand but you're trying to maneuver your way through. Maybe it is that maybe you're in Isaiah's time where he had to shout out to the people and say, be careful what you're doing, please, and cease from doing evil. And you're trying to repent where you're unsure of how to get back to God. Maybe it is that you are like Mary and Martha who think all is lost. But God was just a few days away. He was just taking his time deliberately so that he could show off himself. Huh? Whichever it is that you are tonight, can we pray together? Can we realize that the very nature of God is to build the kingdom to glorify him? We receive the kingdom not through the things that we gain. Oh my God. But through the things that we give. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we believe in you. We love you so much that we sometimes meander trying to do your own work. But we ask you, dear God, to cause a repentant, renewing spirit inside of us. Give us this faith that the elders had. Allow us to be forgiven, dear God. Give us mercy just like you showed Abraham. Just like you showed many of the others who also falter and had their own issues in their own time. But give us this enduring hope to push through. I know that even in the darkest hour you are still there. Give us the hope that can never die. Give us the faith that will cause us to allow some things far off to reach into your heavenly plane and glorify your kingdom. Amen. Good night, everybody. I am, as ever, Brother Johnil Jermaine Alcock. We are the Hellshire United Church. If it is that you're looking to build your relationship with God, you can always join us, whether you want to stream in with us or you join us physically at our church you can reach out to us at any of these ways a congregation of the united church in jamaica and the cayman islands this is our facebook page we stream every uh tuesday at 7 30 but we also stream on sundays for a normal worship service at nine in the morning we are on instagram hucjm our email is hellshire united church at yahoo.com on our telephone number 
is 876-665-6513. Please uh, let us now rush to this closing song that reminds us that God has always been faithful. I love you, Lord. Oh, your words never fail. And all my years are held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay in my bed, oh, I
So next week we will be doing uh, something from Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, that uh, verse is from Hebrews uh, let me project it back we'll be talking about running the race of God to the best of our abilities it's actually titled run with patience but I want to uh, title it let us run the race right so it says wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us so it probably should have been more aptly titled let us run with patience the race it's important for it to probably be named that but let's talk about it next week and figure out what is this phrasing about great cloud of witnesses what is the apostle paul talking about right here so everybody thank you so much for tuning in for tuesday night bible study as usual i want you to have a great rest of the week please do uh be safe and uh Keep cool until we see each other next time, either on the stream or at church or um, through the various things that we do as a fellowship. And know that God has been calling us to strengthen our faith and our hope. It takes so much to go through life and endure some of the things that we always do. We always have seasons. Notice there are seasons to life that things happen over time and that you have to just move through God with it. And it may seem sometimes that it's dark and tiring and frustrating, but God knows what he's doing. Just trust in him. Have faith like the elders did. And then you will get your good report too. The hope that endures is right inside here. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. Good night, everybody.